I want to thank Dr. Blum first for inviting me back for second year. I was here one year ago. Um, I've gotten to know Dr. Charles pretty well at uh, research conferences. I see him once a year at the ACRAC conference, and I consider him a, an amazing ambassador for SOT to the uh, outside world. And in that spirit, I think he sees me as something of an ambassador from the external world to the <laughs> SOT conference here. Uh, he sees something of value in what I've done in relationship to SOT, and, I, and I'm flattered that he uh, thinks that. I noticed on the program that uh, my teacher in SOT is actually going to be here, at least on Saturday, Dr. Richard Robertshaw. Um, I haven't seen him in over 30 years, and I hope both of us will be together for the, uh, another 30 years from now for the 2045 SOT Research Conference, no doubt talking on the ultra-geriatric sacroiliac <laughs> joint. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but um, my talk is a little bit like, uh, or at least in the spirit of the previous talk by Drs. Getzel and Chinapi in reviewing something that I did kind of 20 years ago, or in my case, 15 years ago. I wrote an article on uh, pelvic torsion. This was a review article looking at uh, what it is anatomically, uh, what implications it has for treating people, what clinical information there, there is, outcomes involving treatment for pelvic torsion. Um, um, the last 15 years have been relatively kind to it in the sense of clinical outcomes, in, in my view. Uh, but what has happened is that there's been some challenges to a pelvic torsion from very high-tech studies on the movement of the sacroiliac joint. And uh, my submission to this conference really is an update to that review article in the light of the newer information coming in on the very, very small movements that we now know uh, can occur in the sacroiliac joint. Uh, I thought it would be good to start out with a review of what pelvic torsion actually means. And it refers to uh, an opposite rotation of the two ilia around an axis, an axis that goes through uh, the, uh, through the pelvis uh, perpendicular to the sagittal plane. Now, uh, here are um, three concepts of how that would occur. Um, the one on the far left is actually the one which is anatomically correct, and it's an ancient model. This goes back to the 1930s. The first article on pelvic torsion, at least from an anatomist, was written in the 1930s by Pitkin and Pheasant, and they specified that the ilia would rotate in opposite directions around an axis that is right here through the symphysis pubis. Unfortunately, uh, not only in chiropractic, but also in physical therapy and osteopathy models, the axis for interdominant rotation is often seen as in another place, either through the hip joint over here. Uh, Hugh Logan was especially clear on that being the axis, uh, to, unfortunately to his detriment, I'm afraid. And uh, right here, in many contemporary models, we see an axis through the sacroiliac joint. One reason why chiropractors are so fond of this axis over here is that what you get in return for that is uh, having a model of the functional short leg that goes along with pelvic torsion. If the ilia rocked posteriorly in this direction here around this axis, it would draw the hip up over here. That would be true. Unfortunately, it would also draw the symphysis pubis up over here. And what I've shown in this sort of uh, reversed uh, uh, lighting model over here is that what you get in return for the short leg model over here is complete luxation of the front of the pelvis. Now, I'm not entirely sure what Desjarnet thought about pelvic torsion, where he might have situated that axis, but I would submit to you that um, it does kind of create a problem, I think, for SOT practitioners, but I digress a little bit. And what exactly is the function of the low block that, that is being used, both for prone blocking in Category 1 and supine blocking in Category 2? Uh, there is some discussion warranted on the anatomic effect of the low block, because it's not spinning anything around this, this axis because that is not the axis. This is the axis that you'd have to contend with. Let me move on though. Uh, this is what pelvic torsion again looks like um, in the frontal plane. This comes from the excellent spinography book by Roy Hildebrand. And uh, here's a fuller view of it showing some lateral or sagittal plane views of it. I think if I uh, don't watch my time, I'll never get to the end. So I'm not gonna go through all these static listings here that belong to it. But Hugh Logan, I think, gets the most credit uh, for having put together the, uh, the effects on the lumbar spine and all the different bones that are part of the pelvic complex over here. We have to keep in mind that if one of the innominate bones were to misalign, it doesn't do so in any isolated fashion. The lumbar pelvis should be seen as a gearbox or any turn of the screw by any one of those bones has an obvious and automatic consequence for all the other bones. What you never see on, um, on an illustration like that, which shows you all the static misalignments or all the fixations and restrictions that are also there, let alone the functional derangement that involves the entire body, as some of the previous speakers have talked about, including the craniosacral mechanisms. The um, sacrum, of course, has to deal with the fact that the innominate bones are turning uh, in opposite directions. They're 
obvious uh, accommodations that have to take place in the sacroiliac joint. Uh, Fred Illy, I think it was Fred, Dr. Illy, the Swiss chiropractor, described that very well in the 1960s in, in Europe and had a, a large impact on some American practitioners by the 1970s. Roy Hildebrandt uh, took this gyroscopic model of accommodation from the work of Fred Illy and explained that when the innominate bones went into a state of torsion, that there were three rotations that occurred at the sacral base. Uh, one way of looking at this sacral accommodation was to conceive of it as a gyroscope, a simultaneous rotation around the X, Y, and the Z axis. Uh, the, the, the um, metaphor of using a gyroscope to explain it is a little bit hyperbolic if you think about it. A gyroscope uh, spins at rapid speed to maintain balance, and I think the idea of the sacrum spinning in that regard is a bit of a stretch. But we get the idea that the sacrum will rotate around the x, the y, and the z axis in order to accommodate for the ilia swinging past each other in opposite directions. So this is what rotation around the x-axis looks like. For those of you who are of my generation of chiropractor, this is from the amazing Spinal Anatomy book Angie, some of you would recognize this book. And then, of course, um, I should, before I take that one down, I should point out that uh, on the side of the ilium, uh, where there is posterior rotation, the sacral base would be defined as nutated. And then, uh, and then uh, vice versa, on the other side, the innominate bone, which is rotated anteriorly, has left in relationship to it a counter-nutated sacrum. This is a little bit paradoxical at first glance because uh, it's hard to imagine how the sacrum can nutate on one side and counter nutate on the other, given that it's a, uh, a fixed bone. Being from the state of California, I would want a San Andreas fault to run through the uh, sacrum, whereby it can nutate on one side and counter nutate on the other. Uh, the problem goes away if we understand that nutation is not a property of a bone, it's rather the property of, a, of the sacroiliac joint. So what we really have is the innominate swinging posterior leaving a nutated sacrum in relationship to it, while on the other side, the innominate bone has moved anteriorly and left in relationship to it, a, 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 a counter-nutated sacrum. I hope I'm clear and as clear as I can be in 21 seconds that I've allocated to that point. Yes, doctor. I'm just trying to clarify the, the definition of nutation versus rotation. Nutation is an anterior inferior dipping of the sacral base. That's how it's universally defined, but what people often leave out is it's in relationship to something not the center of the Earth or the planet Neptune, it's in relationship to the innominate bone. And so once we understand that the sacrum, is, um, the sacrum is what's moving in relationship to the ilia, if I could put that clicker down for one second, if you imagine a sacral base where my fist is here, when the innominate bone moves posterior, it's equivalent to the sacrum as having knotted its base anteriorly in relationship to it. So if I look at that sacral base here and see an innominate bone moving this way, that is nutation of the sacrum on the right. And then on the other side, if this innominate were to move anteriorly, that is counter-nutation of the sacrum on the left. So I can truly have my cake and eat it too, which is nutation on one side and counter-nutation on the other without doing the impossible, which is splitting a fixed structure down the middle. <coughs> I better move on. <laughs> I'm not omnidirectional in my <laughs> hearing, so I didn't hear what you said, but I hope you were agreeing with it, me. It, it, yeah, no, no, all I'm saying, in SOT, they call it nutation. Nutation is, would be extension of the sacrum, and counter-nutation would be flexion. That truly is a can of worms, because when you get into the literature terms, flexion and extension in relationship to the sacroiliac joint are not always used the same way. No, I know. It's a, not only between SOT, perhaps, and other practitioners, but between other practitioners and themselves. It's a jungle. So, so I, that's why I use my fist to make a <laughs> But I, I better move on, because he's going to get mad at me if I don't finish in 10 minutes. This is the uh, second axis of rotation. This is a rotation around the z-axis. And I'll simply point out that the sacrum um, is rotating uh, around that z-axis and laterally flexing is what is seen on this slide. In essence, the sacral apex over here points towards the AS ilium is the bottom line. And then finally, the third direction of rotation is a uh, rotation around an axis which is perpendicular to the base of the sacrum. Um, it's not entirely clear. We wouldn't call that the y-axis because the <laughs> The axis that I'm talking about is actually oblique to the y-axis by a few degrees, but you get the idea. Looking at me, if you envision my sacral base is looking like, this, like so, tipped anteriorly and inferiorly, the axis that I'm talking about would be oblique, and the sacral base turns around it this way. The common phrase, rotated sacrum, 
I guess used in SOT as well, uh, refers to axis uh, rotation around this axis. So putting it all together, uh, this is a drawing that comes from the physical therapy literature that I encountered in a textbook on the spine by the, uh, by the British uh, physiotherapist uh, Gregory Grieve, who hated you more than you could possibly know. He hated chiropractic, but honestly, he was a brilliant manual therapist, and uh, he, uh, he drew, or at least took from the physiotherapy writing of Kramer, a wonderful drawing of everything that I've been talking about. You can see here the uh, ilium, which has gone posterior and inferior and medial, I might add. That's what that arrow signifies. Here we have our anterior superior ilium on the other side over there. This uh, arrow right here represents the nutated sacrum that I was describing. This arrow here represents the so-called rotated sacrum around that axis, which is a little bit oblique to the y-axis. Uh, this arrow here is very interesting. This shows the uh, foot flare that most chiropractic techniques say occurs on the side of the PI ilium. We have that in SOT, don't we, the foot flare? Mm -hmm. They're called abduction of the foot in medicine or toe out in many chiropractic techniques. And this over here refers to the hyperextension of the hip joint, uh, which is also said to occur uh, by many people on the side of an AS ilium. Uh, moving along here, now let me get to really the second part of my talk, which is what has challenged this wonderful concept of pelvic torsion over the last, I'd say, 15 years, a gathering storm, as I put it. Very high, very high technology has come in that is called Rentgen Stereo Photogrammetric, Photogrammetric Analysis. I'm sorry I bungled that, but that's 15 syllables if you do the math. And if I say that again, I'm going to call that RAS technology. That's a kind of cruel technology. It involves finding students that are not doing very well, who'll do anything for a grade, and pounding tantalum balls into their pelvis, into the sacrum, and into the ilium. Little, little tiny millimetric pieces of metal that can be seen on the way. So if, I ha if we have these balls embedded in the sacrum and the ilium, uh, what happens is that we, when we then put somebody in a stress position, such as this, this is straddle position, or in one-legged stance, we can now use x-rays taken from the frontal plane and the sagittal plane and see where those balls went or didn't go for that matter and measure the movements of the sacroiliac joint. And what's happened is we with this very high quality technology that these movements are much smaller than we previously thought. So all those people that think that they're repositioning bones and this and that and finding movement, doing gelays tests and so forth, are now posed with a very tough challenge. Now my first response was to throw my hands up and say this technology can't be true because if it is true, then I never saw all the things that I've been seeing all these years and I'm not anyone who thought that. We don't like finding things like that. This is a review of that literature. I am running out of time. I'm going to steal a minute or two from my next lecture, but I won't use up my allotted time. But this is a, a very nice review article that has very, very stringent inclusion criteria, probably too stringent in my view, but when all is said and done, it adds together those articles that have used this technology and related technologies and confirms very little sacroiliac movement. Anyone from my generation, 1960s and 70s, that went to uh, graduate school in those years and in social science, I did in economics of all things. Don't even ask how you get from economics to chiropractic. But we all almost memorized this book called The Structure of Scientific Revolution by Thomas Kuhn. And the point of that book was to explain that when science develops, we like to think of it as adding new information to old information in a very harmonious way. But what actually happens is that sometimes we find out things that violently conflict with what we knew before, and then we get a paradigm change that happens very, very abruptly. Many uh, of the people that I read and hang around with at research conferences are telling me that we have uh, reached that point of paradigm change for the sacroiliac joint, and everything that we now once thought was true and useful is now stupid. <laughs> and I would submit to you that I think uh, this is an exaggeration of what Kuhn had in mind, and I think Kuhn would not actually agree with that assessment. Uh, here's all the things that no longer have happened if we accept the new technology. I don't have time to read this list to you, but I, I, this is in the uh, proceedings of the conference, mm -hmm. along with my original review article. So I'd like you to, if you're interested in this, read over this long list of things over here that, that never have happened, apparently. The, the thing is, they did happen, um, but what has changed is that we can no longer explain things the way we once did. We, we can't just put our heads in the sand and say this new technology is no good. I contacted my favorite two biomechanists, you know, names that are well known, and I asked them if they thought that this technology was valid and reliable and so forth, and they assured me that it was. And 
It means if we want to keep citing all the things that I'm talking about there, we can do that, but we have to come up with more contemporary explanations of how those things came about. We don't throw them away, but we need to understand them better. So um, these are my two articles. Uh, I, this is a re the one on the upper right there is a review article I wrote on how you can produce pelvic torsion by having a person stand on a book or something like that. The anomaly bones rotate if you create an artificial leg length inequality. And I reviewed the literature for that and then a follow-up article. And just when I was getting ready for this conference, I did a, I went around to see what's new and I found that somebody just one year ago, citing only two people, one of them being me, had repeated, you know, inspired by my, my work, had uh, much to my amazement, put under somebody's foot and did it again using very high quality technology, stereo, photogram, you know, the same thing over there, and found that he got a five degree rotation of one anomaly bone and a four degree rotation in the opposite direction of the other bone, and I guess this never happened either. That's one year ago. I don't know what to tell you. So um, this speaks for itself. Reports of the demise of pelvic torsion have been greatly exaggerated probably, and that's Mark Twain if you didn't recognize him. And um, let, me, let me give you good news for the practice of SOT. And uh, if you find something that is misaligned, perhaps misaligned by a lot, that's not really refuted by the demonstration that sacroiliac joints might be very minute. Um, they may be very misaligned to begin with and, and maybe not move much from that state, but it doesn't mean they weren't really misaligned. And a lot of people are throwing these high quality movement studies in our face as if somehow that had something to do with static asymmetry. It's really a very apples and oranges situation. So I would say to you that um, there may be uh, what I like to think of as butterfly effects where very, very minute derangements of the sacroiliac joint may have profound effects on the entire body. Uh, you're all familiar with this butterfly thing. I don't have time to elaborate on it. Um, the sacroiliac joint, surprise, surprise, is innervated mostly with uh, nociceptors, that is for pain receptors, but there are also position and mechanoreceptors in there. And I would submit to you that even minus big movements, maybe, maybe tiny changes in, in, uh, in the innominate bones would have effects through the nervous system that can be pretty profound and ramified throughout the entire body. Uh, SOT as a technique has never been afraid of uh, inferring large things happening from very microscopic uh, movements as, the as my predecessors on the program described for the cranial movements. You've never been worried about people questioning that in terms of the effects on the entire body. And for the SI joint, I think the fear would be even be less. I'd better wrap it up. Recommendations for research. I don't want to patronize you. I think you know what job you have to perform over here. But it's good to have ambassadors from the outside world come in and let you know what people are looking at when they look at the points that you're trying to make. So um, let me move on. Well, my next. Uh, if there's any time afterward, I'll take questions afterward. There'll be time. Okay. All right, thank you. I haven't, ex haven't extended my welcome. Huh? Okay. So, um, as I understand it, um, a, a slot appeared in, in the program that wasn't anticipated, and so I've been asked to talk about uh, something that Dr. Blum saw me present at the last uh, ACC conference just in March of this year. And uh, what I did there was give the results or provide the results of a systematic review I did of the literature on the accuracy of spine pelvis. Now I know this is not exactly left field to SOT practitioners. Uh, two of my predecessors on the, on the curriculum today uh, were going over uh, SOT treatment procedures that in some level involved uh, finding vertebra, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, you look at the cranial, what is it, the, the uh, chiropractic manipulative reflex techniques that are seen in category two involve palpating trapezius fibers and from there uh, treatment to a specific vertebra. And I would submit to you, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, it better be the right vertebra. Would that be a fair statement? Optimally. Dr. Blum? Optimally. Possibly? Optimally, it would be a Optimally, well that's just it. I like the use of the word optimal because if you were looking for L2 being related to a certain fiber and accidentally landed on L3, maybe, maybe the treatment is not bad, maybe, maybe it's suboptimal. So you'd want to be on the right vertebra. If, and, and if, it's not, uh, if it's not an active vertebra, it won't. So sometimes it can be L3 or L1. It can move around. Depending so on there's, some, there's some, a field of influence yeah. that you want to talk about. But ideally speaking, you have a target vertebra, yeah. just like any other technique or practitioner. So we, we often have a, um, 
exam procedures that are done, let's say, in the upright position or like in the case of a, some doctors, they're looking at a film and finding a level worthy of treatment. And we've taken for granted that if we, if we had a finding an upright patient or a seated patient for that matter, that we could somehow lay our hands exactly on that segment in, let's say, a prone position and, and, be, and be there. And uh, that's, that's something that is really not true if you look at the literature on uh, the accuracy of spine palpation. Now this is obviously of some concern for uh, manual therapists, but I will tell you, if, if anything, it's of greater concern for the anesthesiology profession. They are injecting people, uh, and they are putting uh, epidurals and so forth, and it is vitally important to them to stick their needles in the right place. And when I, when I looked for this literature, I found more articles written in uh, anesthesiology than I did in manual therapy. So this is, the, this is the question. How accurate is static palpation in finding and numbering the levels? So um, I had a search strategy, and um, I better skip this. I don't have time. I looked, at <laughs> I looked at databases, OK? And I will tell you that doing a literature search is more serendipity than it is, it is anything else. You can go to PubMed, find whatever you want, but at some point, like it or not, it involves Google searching. Just having been around, in my case, for 30 years and having a file cabinet from hell with an, uh, a, a gigantic quantity of things in it. So I, I know a lot of stuff just because I've been around. Uh, databases, abstracts, blah, blah, blah. So, um, so um, uh, eventually I found 24 articles, and I was quite aware of a 25th article, and that would be one that I wrote, uh, that is in press and probably going to be in the same issue of JCCA that's coming out with your article, the one that you just mentioned. Um, but I proved that a chiropractor can find Atlas. This is very, very good news. And, and, I, and, and, I, and, I, hope, and I hope that uh, that the upper cervical people are reading and will encourage me to submit something to their upper cervical research conference so that I can, uh, I can be an ambassador from the outside world to upper cervical technique. I hope so, but they're, they're in good shape as far as that goes. So in terms of the articles that I found, there are um, mostly lumbar studies, as you can see. Well, this slide speaks for itself. More lumbar than thoracic and more thoracic than cervical, thoracic junctional area which I split off is a little bit different from neck altogether. So I looked at this as four regions. And then in terms of uh, these studies, in every one of the studies that I found, the whole point was to, uh, was to see how accurate the palpation was in reference to uh, an imaging standard. And in some cases, the imaging gold standard or reference standard was x-ray, in other cases, ultrasound or MR, video fluoroscopy, more photography. And in one unusual study, it was an indwelling catheter was the, uh, was the reference standard. Um, most of the studies came from anesthesiology, but almost an equal amount from the manual therapy professions. And of course, uh, in, in, in uh, trying to find vertebral levels, people always use landmarks. And all of you as chiropractors are aware of these landmarks. In the lumbopelvic region, the most commonly used one is the, uh, is the uh, iliac crest over here. Uh, also, the PSISs are used. In the, um, let me, before I take the slide down, make a very, very important point. A couple of authors, Chakraverti, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, and another uh, investigator named Kim, and, and others as well have pointed out that a very tragic mistake has been occurring over the years. We have been teaching that the, uh, L, that the L4 vertebra lines up with the iliac crest. Every person in this room, at least among the chiropractors here, have studied that and, and been using it over the years. And that's relatively true uh, if what you're doing is looking at where an x-ray shows the iliac crest in relationship to the lumbar spine. What we have not appreciated over the years is that when, when we put our hands on what we believe to be the iliac crest, we're much higher than that, especially on chunkier patients who have a high BMI. And what's actually happening is that there's a lot of protoplasm under the fingers, and we're actually finding L3. And that means that uh, when people were looking for L4, they were more often than not in L3. And when they were looking for L2, they were really on L1. You see where this is going? This has had a devastating effect on accuracy for finding things uh, in the lower part of the body. Now, the, um, we have a similar effect. Uh, well, and this, this slide is about the landmarks used for the cervical spine over here. Uh, you know that vertebra prominence is often used, but also motion palpation has been used. Uh, finding the last freely movable vertebra and assigning that to C6 is what is used. In a thoracic spine, I'm pretty sure everybody in this room at some point learned the rule seven up, seven down. That scapula tip lines up with C7 stand, T7 standing and C6 prone. 
I've been on a mission from Cairo God for the last seven years to show that this is incorrect. And, and this actually uh, began with a study of mine that went wild. It actually blew up. And I learned by mistake, by accident really, that, that in the standing position, the scapula lines up more, more often than not with T8 rather than with T7. And in the prone position with T9 rather than uh, T6. So the new rules ought to be, uh, ought to be what would it be, eight up and nine down. You know, this, this may be wreaking havoc on your attempts to find fibers and as they relate to vertebra. I'll have more to say about that later. But here are some of the, uh, this is what we find in the accuracy studies. Among those 24 studies, most of the lumbar mistakes are people, people lining them higher than they, than they should be. Uh, in the thoracic spine, they also tend to be more cephalid, more often than not actually. In cervical spine, there aren't enough studies to establish a trend. In looking at these studies, the accuracy rates uh, for the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine using a strict, strict criteria, that means they're exactly in the right place, are 56, 33, and 56 percent. But as many people have pointed out, and as Dr. Plum was just implying a moment ago, sometimes the next best thing to be on the exact vertebra would be on one above or below it. And what I did is um, I tried to cull from these articles a more liberal definition of a and In some cases, they just reported how often they were level or below. And in many cases, there was enough information provided from the raw data for me to do like a, a post hoc analysis of it to harvest the data. And, and in almost all cases, I came up with a a more liberal definition of accuracy. And you can see, if you're a little bit generous about it, we have 87%, 56%, 89%, things maybe not as grim as what might, one might suppose. Confounding factors. Among these confounding factors, this is the least most puzzling to me. It, one of the investigators found that the further you were from the landmark you were using to find something, uh, in spite of your common sense telling you that this would make your specificity less accurate, it really made no difference. Isn't that amazing? So if you were using the iliac crest to find L4, uh, you would do any better than if you were using it to find, say, T11 or something. The distance did not matter. Uh, I already made this point about the uh, radiographic iliac crest not being the same as the palpatory crest. Uh, let me show you how this led a very good man to go, to go astray. Broadbent, in my opinion, did the finest study of its kind on the lumbar spine here. And he reports this. I don't know if, I think I made this curve from his data. This is not in his article. But he's showing you that when he was uh, looking for uh, various lumbar landmarks, his accuracy rate um, was only 60%. And more often than not, he was here instead of where he wanted to be here. He was one level, he was one level higher than he wanted to be. And that's what he reported in his study. Well, I look at that, and what I see is that poor old Broadbent over here um, has a friendship problem over here. Had he understood the difference between the palpatory and radiographic landmark here, his accuracy would have been much higher. You see what I've done over here? I just, sh I just shifted what his findings are in relationship. He's, he should have studied where the crest is in relationship um, to an x-ray before he used the landmark rule to judge his own accuracy. He got it all backwards. Um, that's what I'm saying here. This is, this is my own study from a certain year. This is our raw data in trying to find uh, T4, T7, and T10. And we thought that we were off by one level at first until I realized once again we had a frame shift problem. Here's what our data looks like reinterpreted once we realized that the scapula lines up with T8 rather than T7. Uh, same thing, another scapula study. I don't have the time to explain it. Another scapula study gone wild two more authors whose accuracy was a lot higher than they themselves thought. They were at the mercy of a, of a landmark rule which was inappropriate. So when I publish, I do my published version of this article, I'm not only going to report what the authors thought about their own work, but I'm going to report what their accuracy level would have been had they appreciated what these landmarks actually corresponded to. Takeaway points. Um, uh, I will make all these slides available. I have been notified I am literally out of time over here. Out of time, out of time. Let me see if I have a wrap-up point. This problem is a lot worse for uh, anesthesiology than it is for you. Whatever the consequence of a chiropractic or other manual therapist being on the wrong bone, think about it if you're putting needles in somebody. Uh, the biggest problem occurs um, when you are putting in an epidural. Uh, if you um, 
Incidentally, uh, insert that needle in the conus medullaris instead of at a lumbar level, you're in danger of producing a potentially catastrophic outcome. Uh, anesthesiology has moved on from manual palpation to using ultrasound and a video fluoroscopy to guide the insertion of needles. So I don't know if they're in a terrible position anymore. What I don't know, being a chiropractor, is, is what the what the, what the uh, anesthesiologist uh, you know, in the village is out there doing. I only know what people say in articles they should be doing. I don't really know how often they're palpating to find where to put their guides. And maybe you could tell me later. I don't know. I, in I intend to find out before I publish this to see, to see if it's a big practical concern today. For us, it's really on the level of charting. Did we treat people where we thought they treated, where, where we treated them and so forth? Uh, but again, um, more importantly, I think, it really has been much worse than we thought, uh, being able to prove that we are treating people where we think they are treating them. I did publish an article in the Journal of Chiropractic and Manual Therapy on, um, on the difficulties involved in mapping an exam finding that was identified in an upright position to a treatment position in the prone position. And I showed, a, I came up with a method of doing that accurately that I call the, a, I should call the Cooperstein mapping method, that's what I call it. Um, this is not that important. I, I'm going to stop because I know, I know that he's, I don't want to no, nice annoy my timekeeper over here, but, but uh, I, I would say to you that what I've learned over the years, I've been in practice for 30 years, is that nothing's really right or wrong, but, but some things are more optimal than others. And uh, I've come to the conclusion that when you treat people at the wrong bone or using the wrong vector or any other thing, what you wind up with is not really hurting the patient. Um, but maybe a suboptimal outcome. And what I've learned, especially from the McKenzie people more than anyone else, is that uh, when you do the right thing, you get a better outcome than doing the wrong thing. But usually you get, a, you get a, an outcome that is better than nothing, even when you're doing the wrong thing. So, so, so this is really a, an effort to, to maybe improve outcomes, but I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep out of destroying people. We should talk more about the Jarnout's L5, uh, L1 <laughs> study over there, but at least he was able to put Humpty Dumpty together again. Okay, so, so that's, the good, that's the good part about it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay.